Welcome to the Michael Shermer Show. I'm your host, Michael Shermer. My guest today is Dave Rubin. He's been on the show before. Most of you know Dave as the host, creator and host of The Rubin Report, which is a extremely successful um, show, over a million followers. Uh, so he's in the top 0.01% of podcasters and online content producers in terms of the size of his audience. It's probably the most watched talk show about free speech and, and big ideas on YouTube. It's described. He's the author of Don't Burn This Book, which was a New York Times bestseller, and the co-founder of the community building platform called Locals. He now lives in Florida with his husband, David, and their dog, Clyde. And as you'll hear in this um, conversation, they're going to have two babies How about that. His new book is Don't Burn This Country, Surviving and Thriving in Our Woke Dystopia. So we, dis uh, we discussed at length, well, wokeness and political correctness and race and gender and trans and women's rights and trans rights, conflicting rights, and uh, what the solutions to these various uh, issues are. That is bottom-up market solutions uh, versus top-down uh, government regulation type solutions on such things as, you know, they, how does the NCAA decide who can compete in a women's division and male to female trans? Is that acceptable after one year of hormone suppressant uh, treatment? Well, we discussed that. And what about big tech? Should we break up, um, you know, Google and Facebook and Twitter and all that stuff? Or should they be regulated? Should they just have competition from other companies? Do they have too much of a market head start for anyone to possibly compete with them because they are, in essence, a monopoly? Anyway, we get into all that. We go, I see how far he's willing to go with the kind of anarcho-capitalist ANCAP, as they're called, uh, solutions, which is not the world we live in. Very unrealistic. Uh, and so we then pull back from that and discuss some other possible solutions. Anyway, Dave's uh, always interesting to talk to. He's a thoughtful guy and um, and is always willing to change his mind uh, when the facts change, which is a good thing to do. All right. If you enjoy the podcast, do give us some support at uh, skeptic.com slash donate. That is, you go to skeptic.com slash donate and your donations are tax deductible because they go to the Skeptic Society, which is a 501c3 nonprofit. And uh, that's what supports this podcast primarily. So thanks for listening. All right, Dave Rubin, nice to see you. You are a returning champion. <laughs> Michael, it's good to see you. You know, I'm always worried now that I have left California to go to the freer pastures of Florida. If I'm ever going to see any of my Californian friends in real life again, <laughs> we've been reduced to this. I, do you ever get out here? Because I... Legally, well, I, mean, I don't know I, that I'm allowed back in Cali. About, uh, within about a, as, as of about a month ago, uh, we were talking about going to Disney World, but uh, but after they've gone full of woke, I thought, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if I want my kid to meet uh, Snow White and, and have a talk about his, his gender identity because he plays with trucks and, and cars and airplanes, and he seems pretty, uh, pretty c committed to what he is at the moment, so I don't want to confuse that. <laughs> How, how old is your son again? Because he's right he's in that, that age, right? He's somewhere between, yeah, he's five, so right. So kindergarten through third grade, they don't want a government employee discussing gender identity with a child, and that is what everyone's going crazy about. I mean, you think the woke thing went a little nuts or what? Mm-hmm, yeah. Yeah, for sure. I think, uh, you know, age appropriateness. I think I had sex education in seventh grade, maybe, right? So what, what yeah. age is that? Yeah, maybe me too, seventh grade. Uh, 12th, 12, 13, something like that. Yeah. So that seems about right. And, you know, also it's okay to teach about slavery and the Holocaust and genocide and all that in high school, maybe, you know, it's like, why, why slam this down some poor little kids throw it? And my little guy, you know, he's just a happy little, you know, he's not thinking about any of this stuff. I mean, he, if, you know, if they brought these subjects up to him, he'd be like, what are you talking about? I just want to play with my truck, <laughs> you know? You know, it's so funny because the week before this whole thing blew up here in Florida, I was at my niece, my niece, my sister lives in Florida here with her husband and, and two kids and she's got a third on the way. And I'm at my niece's uh, sixth birthday party. And it's at a little paint shop where the kids make, uh, they make goo now, they make slime, you know about this, where they take the shaving yep. cream and they turn it into slime like Nickelodeon old school. 
And I sat there with these kids and I'm sitting at a table with like five little, you know, beautiful girls. They're sitting there making slime, getting paint all everything. I realize you can't wear a nice shirt to a kid's birthday party. I know that now. Um, but they're doing all this stuff. And it's like the idea that anyone, you know, and I brought David there, my husband. He's also the uncle of my niece, obviously. The idea that any of these kids would look at us and be like, tell us about sexuality or gender identity while they're making slime. It's just so stupid. And the way the media has covered this, it's, it's so consistent with so many of the things actually that are in the book and that you and I have been screaming about mm -hmm. for, for quite some time. Yeah, that's in fact, our latest issue of Skeptic is on trans matters. So we, we dive into all this. And, you know, the problem here is that, um, you know, you have a tiny, tiny percentage, probably well less than 1%, maybe even a tenth of 1% who have this gender dysphoria and or later confusion about their gender identity or so on. It's pretty small. And on the one hand, it's kind of a sign of how much moral progress we've made that now we're, you know, we've kind of scaled that all the way down to the, you know, that one tenth of one percent. We want to make sure they have all the rights that everybody else has. OK, so that's good. But it, but then you have conflicting rights like, you know, male to female trans adults or, you know, late teens competing in women's sports. Well, trans rights. But what about women's rights? And, mm -hmm. you know, in a liberal democracy, it's like you can't have everything. Right. You, you write about this in your book. You know, there's, there's no utopia and the attempt to create a utopia creates conflict. Well, it's interesting because, you know, a guy like you who's done so much work in, in debunking conspiracy theories and trying to just get people to think clearly. Right. When I started going in that direction career wise, everybody was like, you got to talk to Shermer. You got to have Shermer on like he's he's the, the gold standard in this thing. And you know, you've been one of the people that I, I consider, a, well, you're obviously a friend, but, but also a mentor. You've helped me clean up some of my thoughts. And even though you and I have some disagreements, which of course I'm happy to, to discuss if you want, you know, when it comes to something like the trans thing, there are some pretty, I think, basic ways we can honestly assess the issues that, just, that you just brought up. So for example, if, if you're an adult and you wish to transition or you feel that you're in the, the, your biological sex does not match up with the gender identity that you feel you have, and you wish to live however you wish to live and wear whatever you want to wear, I have no problem with that, obviously. That, at the same time, does not change your biology. That's number one. Facts are still facts. The biology is still the same. Uh, but then when it comes to the sports thing, it's like we all know, we all know that a biological male should not be competing in a women's uh, athletic event. You know, the, the simple fact is, just look, forget the swimming thing which is pretty obvious. Take, you could take the worst washed up NBA player at the you know 17 year veteran who barely can move scoring one point a game at the end of his career. He would be the MVP of the WNBA. That's just the truth. Did you see this video that it's from a couple years ago, uh, but it's been making the rounds again of Serena Williams on David Letterman. Did you see this by oh, chance no, no, where she basically one. says, Oh, it's incredible. I, I'm going to send it to you. She basically, this is from when Letterman still had a show on CBS, so it's probably about seven or eight years ago, that Andy Murray, who was one of the best male tennis players in the world at the time, that he had been calling her and saying, hey, let's have a match. You know, we could do a match for charity. Let's do it. And she basically is like, no, men's tennis and women's tennis, this is her words, I think she says, are completely different sports. They hit the ball harder. They're faster. She says he would beat me 6-0, 6-0 in, I think she says in 10 minutes. So she's being a little facetious, obviously. That's almost impossible. But the point is, Serena Williams, the greatest female tennis player of all time, is not anti-woman by saying that. She is the greatest female tennis player of all time, and we should honor her for that. It doesn't mean that men and women are the same. So I think we just have to try to say these things clearly and honestly, and most people do agree with that. Yeah. There was a match, a German guy, I think in 97, played both the Williams sisters one-on-one -on -one each. Uh, and he was ranked 203rd in the world. And he beat, uh, I, think, I think he won 6-0, 6-1. One of the sisters got one game on him. But there's another video that's going around of, of uh, mixed doubles in professionals. So it's, it's uh, like Roger Federer and some, one of the other top female professionals. And then one of the other top pros and Serena Williams. And the women, they couldn't even get the racket on the ball on the serve. I mean, the serve was so fast. No matter how far back they stood and how ready they were, they couldn't even get the racket on the ball. It's like, okay, 
yeah, so that's pretty clear. Same thing with swimming, the Leah Thomas case. And uh, in cycling now, there's a 21-year-old British um, woman, male to female trans, yeah. who wants to compete against women. But fortunately, I they I saw that, they and said, by the way, you, you know, yeah. I tweeted about that one, and, and you responded. You had a great response, because it did clarify something that I've been wondering probably since I'm six years old, which is on the male bike, why is the bar oh, right. higher? Because right. guys have stuff that can get crushed. I never understood. It should be the, the slanted bar, but you explained it for yes. me, if you'd like to tell the audience. <laughs> oh, well, yeah, just the, the, the kind of sloping dip on, the, uh, on old bikes for girls was because they were wearing skirts. And the this, this skirt doesn't have to then drape over the top tube on the bike. All women cyclists wear, uh, ride the same bikes that, that guys ride, just probably smaller or whatever the average height is. But, yeah, they're all the same. Yeah, in that case, though, she it's interesting because this will be a, a good test case because she actually has been going through the one-year hormone suppression uh, treatment, you know, testosterone suppression, and then, and then marking her own performances and, like, the decline of her um, wattage output, um, per minute per body weight and so forth. And, uh, and it has been going down, uh, for sure. But, but, but that's just a comparison to her, her former male self a few months ago or nine months, a year ago. She's still that is still way above the average for women. And so I think of it as just two overlapping bell curves. There might be a little bit of overlap, you know, the, the, you know, the, the best women and, and the, you know, the worst professional men or whatever, maybe a tiny bit. For, for the most part, on average, you know, they, they cannot compete post when that treatment is done post puberty. So, you know, Leah Thomas went through the one year. The NCAA requires one year of, of, of suppression treatment. She did that and and still, you know, just crushing it because after puberty, all the major changes are made. You could just see her standing there next to the other women, just massive shoulders and huge wingspan and big feet and, yep. and legs and so on, like Michael Phelps. And it's like it, hormone suppression is not going to change any of that. Yeah, and it's interesting also because, you know, what you said at the top was that sometimes these rights come into conflict with each other. And, you know, I know you well enough, and I think you know me well enough, that if, if, if any of these things were about rights, meaning we are going to take away someone's rights, well, now we've got a problem, right? This is, of course, I believe in equality of rights for everybody under the law. The issue here is that there is, there is a reality that comes into conflict with something that's not quite a right, but it is a, I guess, privilege, although the word privilege is a little mucked up these days. It's not a right to play in women's sports or to be a women's swimmer or something like that. There is an organization that decides what the rules are related to women's sports and men's sports and men's volleyball and women's volleyball and all of those things. If the organization decides that you can't do it or can do it, that's not an, a conflict on your rights. It's a conflict with, with an organization that's allowed to make rules by itself. Ironically, the, they're creating such a backlash with this. When people see Leah Thomas, that picture that you just referenced, how much bigger uh, Leah is than, than the other girls. And then they watch, did you see the time-lapse video on it? Did you happen to see that where someone sped it up and you see it oh, no, and it's like, man, right. they're not, they're really, oh, it's incredible because you really see it's just like so much faster. It's nuts. And when you see it time lapsed, it really hits you how different this is. Um, I think the backlash to this is, is dangerous in a way because when you force down people's throats, something that they know should not be, a, a young girl should be the number one female swimmer. It's as simple as that, I believe. When you tell them, no, that shouldn't be, you start generating all sorts of anger at probably the very nominal trans person who just wants to live their life and not be an activist and all of those things. They're going to be treated worse because of this. I'm always worried about that outlier case, uh, usually, actually. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the other distinction also to make on that is, is uh, at, at what point does the person identify as a different Gender. So if it happens early, like a, before age five or so, versus when they're in their teens, where we think there might be a social contagion effect going on, where you have some of these high schools where half the girls are identifying as trans or, or, or one of the other variants. Um, you're a gay guy. When did you, at what age did you think, you know what, I'm, I'm not straight like the other guys and I, I'm different in that way? Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you asked, and I'm, I'm ha I don't talk about this stuff that often, but I'm happy to go wherever you want with this. You know, um, it's funny because when I was growing up, I, I played with G.I. Joes, I played with Transformers, 
I, you know, when I got into my, I didn't play sports that much in my younger years, uh, but I did start, especially by the time I was 12 and 13, and then I really came to love basketball, especially, but I played baseball and all of those things. So I never felt like, you hear a lot of people that are like, oh, I was five and I just felt more effeminate or, or something like that. Or I, I, was, I gravitated towards Barbie dolls more than Transformers, whatever it might be. I didn't have that kind of stuff, but, but certainly by the time I was in middle school, I was definitely noticing some attraction that I didn't think my friends were having. It, it just was, but I really kind of just suppressed it. I, you know, I think more now at, that I've hit the ripe old age of 45, I can think back on these things a little bit clearly, a little bit more clearly, let's say. And I think I repressed a lot of that stuff through high school. So I was able to date girls. And, you know, when you're of a certain age, you can pretty much make the parts work no matter what, because you're, you've got, you know, you're growing up and your body's doing all kinds of crazy things. And then I kind of continued that into college and I just sort of, the thing is that you have to also remember the world changes so fast. So now where everything is gay, 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 I would actually argue to the detriment of gay people in a certain way. Everything is so gay all the time now that it's, it's, it's frankly quite annoying <laughs> in, in, a, in a lot of respects. But I had nobody, there was nobody that was either a role model or a seemingly stable human being even that was gay. You know, the, the gay things that were out there were, who'd we have? There was, what was the guy's name in the 70s on uh, Hollywood Squares? The, uh, Paul Lind, you know, the mm, over-the-top yeah. alcoholic <laughs> Paul Lind. Or, or, or right. Harvey Firestein, okay, I'm gay on Mrs. Doubtfire. Or whatever <laughs> gay character was on any TV show was a really over-the-top. I didn't know anyone that was gay. I didn't have anyone that was gay in my family that I knew of. It turns out, I found out that one distant cousin was gay, but not till many years later. Um, so there was nothing to, to look at, to model a life after of that, that made any sense. Ironically, the one thing when I was, I think, uh, about 14 years old that sort of made sense in a gay sense, there, there was an episode of The Golden Girls where Blanche's brother comes out as gay. His name's Clayton, and he says he's gay. And Clayton, if, I don't know if you saw this episode, but it's really interesting. It's a, they do two episodes with Clayton over the course of a year. In the first one, he comes out and he's just a guy. He's just a guy. And you, he, doesn't have, he doesn't seem effeminate. And I'm not judging anyone for that. I'm really not. You are who you are. But he was just a guy and, and Blanche struggles with it mightily. But at the end, they kind of were okay. And then in the, the following season, they have an episode where Clayton is getting married to Doug. And Doug is a cop. And he's just a guy. There is, they, they give them no gay trait or anything. At one point, they make a joke about them singing. But I will tell you a joke that was seared into my brain. It was seared into my brain. This is NBC, 8 o'clock. I believe this is 1990. And this is the joke. Blanche says to Clayton, you know, what is it about Doug that you love so much? What is it about? And he says, well, he's a great guy. And I'd do anything for Doug. And Doug would bend over backwards for me. <laughs> I mean, that is, first off, it's a, sec, it's a gay sex joke, which yeah. they still don't even really make on TV now. We have these sort of, you know, fake gay people, you know, sort of like Anderson Cooper or Andy Cohen. They can't really talk about anything real, but, you know, they are what they are in the TV box. But they made a very subversive gay sex joke. But, but it was more that they were just normal people in my mind. So ironically, that really was the only thing that I had to model it after. And then over the years, obviously, I've met plenty of great gay people. Our friend Douglas Murray, who's become a dear, dear friend of mine, and Peter Thiel and many others. And by the way, all of that being said, I have gay friends that are, some of them are effeminate, some of them aren't. Sometimes I like the effeminate ones more because I think, man, maybe I was just so repressed for so long that I should be more effeminate or something like that. But as I said, I am what I am. And that's all that I am. <laughs> I've heard um, Andrew Sullivan say this, and tell me what you think about this, that he's concerned, for example, uh, the reason why I asked you at what age did you start to feel different? Because what if at this point you were coming of age now in this woke culture and your friends and maybe the one of their teachers or somebody said, hey, Dave, you're not gay. You're not a gay guy. You're actually inside a woman. And then you're thinking, oh, well, hmm, maybe I am. Maybe I'm attracted to guys because I'm secretly a female or whatever the configuration would be. And then at this point, then, well, what should I do about that? Well, you should take these hormones or whatever. And it's like, whoa, okay. 
Is that something you're concerned about? So I think it actually runs even, I'll, I'll give you even, even more twisted version of that. So in uh, Douglas Murray, who I just mentioned, in his last book in The Madness of Crowds, one of the beautiful things that Douglas does when he writes his books is he writes them in very few chapters. He really sort of packs them in and it's very clean. So he wrote his LGB chapter was separate than the trans chapter because he said these things have actually nothing to do with each other. A gay man has no more, so for example, Michael, I have no more in common with a trans person than you have in common with a trans person. We're both, we have different uh, sexual orientations, you and I, but we're both in the, believed to be in the body that we're supposed to be in, and it happens to be our attraction that's different. That's very different than trans. So these things should be separated, that's number one. What the, what the twisted version of what you just laid out there, and I've heard Sullivan talk about it, is, is that if you were to take a five-year-old boy like me, who was playing with Transformers and G.I. Joe and everything else, you would never think that they were gay, right? By the, by the sort of common definition of what gay is. So you'd leave that kid alone. Now what you would do is you'd see the effeminate boy who is five years old playing with the Barbies. And you're right, in the woke ideology, the, the system as it exists and the cultural norms would actually start pushing them to be trans. And if you really think about that, that's actually very anti-gay. Because at the end of the day, that five-year-old boy who's playing with Barbie most likely, first off, he's possibly straight. It might just be a phase, or he's an effeminate straight guy, which exists. Uh, but most likely, he's probably just going to grow up to be a, a gay man in his life. That's probably the reality. But in the n normalcy of where we're at in 2022, the system will do exactly what you just laid out there. So I think you could actually argue that it's anti-gay, that a certain a set of woke parents would rather have a trans kid because that would make more sense in their mind. My son is actually a girl, and that's why he plays with Barbie dolls, rather than, oh, my son just happens to possibly be gay. But the fact that you're even thinking about that at five years old is also bananas altogether. Yeah, interesting. I also wonder if trans itself is a thing to be. Not that the woman wants to be a man or vice versa, but trans is the kind of hep cool thing to be at the moment. Now, maybe that's not the case for most. Maybe it's 50-50, who knows. But I had a student, I don't know, maybe three years ago when this was really starting to take off, uh, a female student who decided mid-semester she was going to be a guy. She changed her name to a guy's name. She cut her hair short. She started dressing in guy's clothes and still didn't even remotely resemble a guy as we kind of stereotypically think of it. Um, but then it occurred to me because she brought it up a lot in, in class conversations. And I thought, I don't think she actually wants to be a male or a man. I think she wants to be trans, that that's kind of the thing to be at, at, the, at the moment. Mm -hmm. C could it also just be at least at some level that she just wanted attention? I mean, could yeah, it be a little yeah, bit of that of mixed in there yeah. too? Yeah. Right? I mean, yeah, it, it, I, that's I why this that is... That's why the, 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 the pressures around this, the fact that all of Disney movies now are pushing this or that Nickelodeon tweets about it every day or that the entire system, the fact that we're talking about this right now when there's a million other things we can talk about, but yet it's obviously important to talk about, the fact that they've somehow, that the machine has somehow pushed this all on us feels very inorganic. As you said at the top, this is not 1% of the people. This might be one-tenth of 1%, might be, and we're not even sure about that, actually. And, you know, one of the things that Jordan Peterson has said about this that I think is pretty important and, and controversial, obviously, is that if you are born biologically male, but you feel that you are a female, okay, fine. Let's say you even wait till you're 18 now. So your body has developed a certain way, your mind has developed a certain way, your brain is, uh, you know, you're somewhat of a functioning adult, although things are still changing even at 18. But let's say you get all the way there and then you're st you still say, no, I'm, I'm actually in the wrong body. A lot of people, a lot of trans people feel that they will, that the problems will be solved by being in the other body. And then many of them find out that's not the truth because there's a lot of other things going on there as we all have other things going on. We all think, oh, I have this one problem and that's the problem. And then you find out that's not exactly the case. They actually address this. I, I think I watched the first two seasons of Transparent, which was on Hulu. And they did address this, that uh, in the last episode of the first season as the father, who's a, you know, a 65 year old man or so is beginning to transition. He meets this friend who is trans 
And she, a biological male, but she basically says to him, you don't know what problems you're about to create for yourself. And I thought that was an interesting way to end the season for a show that actually obviously was, you know, pro-trans. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, yeah, Caitlyn Jenner certainly went through quite a lot, although she's such a big celebrity. But you probably know uh, Deidre McCluskey. Do you know her, the economist? Yeah, I've had her on the show. I think she's one oh, of the greatest thinkers we've got. Yes, of course, you know she's, she's yeah. trans. Well, she wrote this heartbreaking essay about uh, her family's response to her transition. Yeah. It's terrible, just terrible. So, you know, we, we do have to recognize that if this is truly what you are and you make that transition and society is unaccepting, that it's heartbreaking. It, it, can, it can really crush your soul. If I'm not mistaken, Deirdre's kids don't even talk to her anymore. Yeah, they won't talk um, to her, yeah. You know, or at least last we had discussed it, don't. I mean, so think about it. So I, I have no doubt, well, I can't say, I can't speak for Deirdre, but I, I suspect that Deirdre is, of all, of all the possible options in front of her, she's happy that she went through that transition. But if, if that came at the cost of her children not talking to her, like these are real things that are, that are worthy of talking about as opposed to breaking this down to the simplicity of, oh, you're five, you play with Barbies, a teacher should be discussing that with you. And that we leave it at that as if, oh, that is it. Or if you are trans, your life will magically be amazing or something like that. It, it's just not the, re it's just not real. So in your book, you talk a lot about the spread of wokeness over the last several years. And, and we're recording this on April 6th, we'll release it on the pub date of your book. And it, we're going through Disney, you know, making all these public announcements. Do, to what extent do you think these corporations and universities believe this? Or are they virtue signaling? Or are they doing a kind of a preemptive move before the woke mob comes after them? Um, I mean, what's your sense about that? Michael, who was my friend who wrote a book about giving the devil his due? Was there someone <laughs> well, that, that was... did that in the last couple of years? <laughs> Oh, that was me. <laughs> that was you. Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. Then I think you might appreciate my answer on this one. My, my first answer or the first part of my answer would be that we really do have to give the devil his due. The woke, for as much as we may mock them or for as much as we may think they are irrational or um, they, they, they behave in all of the worst ways and all of this stuff, they have wrought incredible destruction on society and they've done it rather quickly. Uh, you know, we can talk about the long march through the institution over decades, but really in these last, say, seven or eight years, where this thing has just completely burst forth, fueled by algorithms and big tech and everything else, they have destroyed an awful lot. So the question of sort of where does it get the energy and how does it get so steeped into all of these institutions is really interesting because my, my view of this is that if you were to ask the, the Disney CEO, who in effect summoned Ron DeSantis to his office a few weeks ago as if he's the king, right? And Ron DeSantis made it clear that he is not the king. Um, you know, basically he has an activist group of employees. We don't know how many there are, but they're on Twitter and they're anonymous and they get a lot of gender pronoun people to retweet them. He gets the activist base and now he is, now he has a board, he has some employees, he has a DIE, a diversity equity, a DEI, diversity equity inclusion group at the, at the company, they welcomed this in. They, they brought all of the bad ideas that were counter to making good programming. I thought that was why when, when Disney brought, bought Star Wars, the, the stuff of my childhood imagination, I thought, oh man, this is so awesome. They are going to fuel this with money and, and, and that will fuel shows that they destroyed it. But, but that's not disconnected from all of this. Well, our friend Pete Bogosian talks about this a lot. You know, once you as an organization choose to say, well, my main goal is no longer to make great programming, but it's to actually infuse programming with my political ideology, as now all these videos are being leaked of Disney executives saying that they're doing this. Once you do that, once you decide, I'm not going to hire the best writer, I will hire the writer based on their color or their gender identity or sexuality or whatever. Once you do all that, you're constantly degrading the system. So I would say it's something like this. You let the thing in, that it festers for a couple years, you throw COVID on top of it where now people aren't even working in the same rooms anymore. So it's much easier to fight over email and video and Zoom and blah, blah, blah. And that Disney in effect is now has a core implosion. I, I, th I truly think it is very possible Disney will not survive this in, in the way that we know Disney. I'm not saying Disney, the corporation is, is gonna just go away. 
But they now have a problem on their hands that's crazy because Ron DeSantis basically was summoned to the office and he said to the, to the CEO of Disney and then released the statement after, what are you talking about? What does this have to do with being against gay people? He's not against gay people. You want to see something, Connor? Do we still have it here, the onesie? I'm going to have my, <laughs> I'm going to have my director find something that's going to show you how not against gay people Ron okay. DeSantis is. Um, but in essence, what he did was say, what are you talking about? This is about having state employees have, have conversations with children that they shouldn't be having. This has nothing to do with bigotry. This has nothing to do with taking away people's rights. And then he ended the statement. It was beautiful what DeSantis did. He said, I suspect that you have an awful lot of parents who go to your parks and watch your movies and buy your products who agree with me. And you're going to have to make a decision about that. And I think DeSantis is winning. I, I think an awful lot of people are angry about this. And again, that obviously has nothing to do with being anti-gay or anything like that. I think once it's in the system, it's a virus. As our other good friend Gad says, says it's a virus. It's a parasite in the system. And they brought it in. They welcomed it in and it's in. Yeah, again, but behind closed doors, I wonder if these executives say, you know, we know this is a bunch of bullshit, but we got to do it because this is the trend of culture. And if we don't, we could be attacked or we could be sued or whatever. The analogy I make is oh, these, yes. uh, these racial sensitivity training programs that everybody has to go through now. I just took one at Chapman University, the annual one, and they are so lame. I mean, first of all, you can kind of hack them, although they have a timer on them, so you can't just fast forward. Uh, and you have to, you know, sort of watch the little videos, vignettes where they have the bisexual person of color talking to the white straight guy and he tells an off color sex joke and you the employee overhear this what should you do a uh spread the joke on your social media because it's so funny b intervene and lecture both of them on why this is incorrect or c call human resources oh gee let's see what could be the right answer oh call human resources how about <laughs> d jump off the roof how about that <laughs> yeah. one wait michael i gotta show you this you know how oh, yeah. you know how anti-gay ron DeSantis is Okay, I went to the me. mailbox yesterday and I had a package from Ron DeSantis's office. Mm. He sent Future us two of these voter. because we're having, <laughs> we're having kids, we're having two babies, as you know, and he sent us two of these, two ones. Oh, nice. So that's how <laughs> anti-gay he is. Actually, no, I, I Dave, did a talk I, I at not, a Prager. You, I did not know that, that you, you're, you're adopting or are you doing um, a surrogate mo a no, mother? No, uh, we have two, we have two surrogates. Uh, that are both pregnant right now, and we have oh, one wow. due in August and one due oh, in God. October. Oh my God! Yeah, well, you know, you, look, I remember a couple of years back when you said I'm going to be a father again soon, I know. and I, I know. thought, all right, you yep. know, Shermer's yep. got a couple of years on me; I can do it too. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, that's right. I uh, see you yeah, out was... there on the bike, man. You're doing your thing and living a good yep. life. So I thought, yep. all right, let's see. Yeah, just keep keep going, right? Absolutely right. Yeah. So. Um, what, where would you say, you know, the kind of the woke infusion started, like maybe 2013, 2014, something like that? Um, and, and what would you say? Yeah, I mean, it? in terms of where it burst, in terms of where it burst into the true culture piece that we're all sort of caught up in right now, I would say it was a right around 2013, 2014. Uh, it was, a, you know, a lot of people sort of connect this to the early Tumblr world. It's not exactly, I, I'm a little older for that, but it was where they were getting a lot of kids on Tumblr where they were retumbling things. It was sort of a visual version of Twitter. And that's where a massive group of these kids who are now, say, 18, really in the, in the thick of this thing now, where they learned a lot of it. You know, then social media amplified all of this. Um, the media jumped in on it. Then there was this weird coalescence between the left, sort of the, the, the more socialist collectivist left of Bernie Sanders, meaning economically left, they then morphed in this very weird way with the identity, the, Marx, the cultural Marxist left, meaning the identity left. So Bernie w loved co the collectivism of economics and they loved the collectivism of identity. And then they tied themselves together in this really, really bizarre way. And then of course, you know, 2016, you have Trump get involved and Trump by basically whether you like him or not, by basically saying some hard truths and saying some things rather politically incorrectly and everything else, that poured fire on it too, or poured fuel on the fire. And then all the algorithmic parts that we don't fully understand. I mean, look at it this way. When, when you see this stuff going on fire on Twitter or elsewhere, 
Does it feel organic to you? Does it feel real? Like, yes, I mean, literally yesterday, I saw out of nowhere, Nickelodeon, a kid's channel. I remember growing up watching Nickelodeon. I'd watch Nick at Night, and they had Three's Company. That's what it used to be. And now it's, they're doing their day of trans visibility and our trans program. Does, does any of this feel organic to you? It, it's sort of what you're saying before. I agree. I don't think that the CEO of Disney, if he honestly read the bill, HB 1557, I don't think he honestly believes that Ron DeSantis is a homophobe or that this has anything to do with that. I don't think that the board for the most, yeah, maybe some activists at the board do, but I don't think most of them do. Um, you know, I've had some discussions with Peter Thiel before he stepped down from the, the Facebook board. It was sort of half activist, but he would often say it was actually just people who just want to go with the crowd. That's what most people want, right? Um, so I think it's, it's a combination of all of those things. We're, we're all sort of doing it to ourselves in a bizarre sense. My, my sense is it's mostly organic as opposed to what you mean. You, are you thinking sort of more top down? Somebody's kind of pulling the strings to make this stuff happen. Uh, I think, me, it it's, I think it's a little bit of both. Uh, yeah. So listen, I would prefer that it's organic. I really would, because even though that's sort of scary in a way, because that means it's sort of seeded everywhere and coming up from the bottom, that seems harder to defeat. Um, I would prefer that because then it would feel authentic to me. What I'm saying is it doesn't feel authentic that every day we wake up and there's another story about a man beating a woman in women's racing and in women's swimming and another Nickelodeon's doing that. And every day there's more and more of it. That part of it does, the media component of it, I suppose, doesn't feel authentic. So there may be some authentic, um, look, part of progress is that you're gonna find more people. You know, when they say now they do a lot of studies and now it does appear that there's more, you know, they always said that it was something like 10% of people are gay. That's what they said. You probably know more numbers on this than me, but they probably, for most of say the last 40 years, they said something like that. It was like 10% are gay, that was the number. Everyone said, now it is possible now when they do studies, you see that that number has ticked up a bit. It is partly possible that that's because gay people got equal rights and it became okay to say you were gay. So people came out of the closet and I would obviously argue that that is a good thing. But is it also possible when you, when you expand that, that, that the activist base comes in and then as you said, the societal pressures of a young kid feeling, I'm trans. And then guess what? A year later, they're not trans. Abigail Schreier wrote a fantastic book about this. So it's a little hard to tell the, the authentic, inauthentic, or the organic, inorganic part of this. Yeah, we had a joke at, uh, when I was an undergraduate uh, of, uh, it was called LUG, Lesbian Until Graduation. You know, maybe it's just a kind of a temporary <laughs> phase or, or, you know, kids are just experimenting. And, and again, as Abigail points out, it's one thing to dye your hair or, you know, get a tattoo or something or wear different clothes or whatnot, but but to actually take hormones or get surgery, and, and again, back to if you were five and and your parents or teachers said, hey, Dave, we're gonna give you these hormones or whatever, you know, that that's where the, again, the conflict between the rights of of the parents and the children and who, who directs those. You know, back to DeSantis, you know, I, I think the point of this is that the conflict is that we have public schools and public places that interact with private citizens and to what extent uh, can they, you know, talk about this or that or the other? I think most parents are probably happy to have the middle school uh, give sex education classes so they don't have to have the talk with their kid. Maybe they're embarrassed or whatever. But, you know, that then if you push it too far, and let's say you're a Christian who feels that abstinence only is the way to go to prevent unwanted pregnancies and abortion and all that, and the school says, well, we're going to teach your daughter how to put a, a, the condom on the banana. So, you know, when the time comes... You know, that, that's, a, again, one of those conflicting rights. You know, who who's, who's has the right to teach their children about sex education? And if we didn't have public so this schools, is a, look, this, if they were this, all just private schools, then then you could pick the one you want. But, but that's not the world we live in. Right. So I think actually the world might be shifting to that world, which, you know, you and I that both have strong libertarian sides probably would be more comfortable in certain respect in a world like that. Because... So for example, I, I think you said seventh grade was when, when you got taught health or whatever. And I, I'm pretty sure it was seventh grade for me as well. And I do remember there was one kid in the class that would leave the classroom uh, when that would happen, or, or he, he didn't have to go to the class. I, I forget what the exact, it had something to do with religion, I sort of remember. I'm completely fine with that. At, at, se at seventh grade, me personally, if the state wants to, basics, basics, that families look a little bit different, if they were teaching anything that was based in bigotry, 
you know, if, if the idea here is that Florida was going to, t at seventh grade, they're going to teach the kids that if you have two dads, that's evil and da 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 Well, now we have a problem, right? And we're not gonna let the two dads go to the, the school concert or whatever it might be. If you want your religious exemption, I believe in religious liberty, uh, if you don't want your kid to go to those classes, I actually would be okay with that. But I think the better solution, if you really care about this, is the movement that's happening right now, which is to fund students and not systems. You know, the Department of Education is way too big. Randy Weingarten is one of the, I think she's the head of the uh, Teachers Association. She became one of the biggest villains of COVID related to what she did with school closures. And even now uh, is still, you know, pushing for a lot of this nonsense. I don't think that we should be putting so much money into public schools anymore. We should, if you're gonna, if you're gonna tax, without going too far down the libertarian rabbit hole, if you are going to tax, then fund the student and give the parent the opportunity to send them to a private school or a charter school or home school or a pod school or a Zoom school, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and then find a community that is more like-minded than you. And if a whole bunch of woke parents want to teach their five-year-olds about gender identity, then allow them to do it. That, in my view, that would be unfortunate, but allow them to do it. And if a whole bunch of, I don't know, say uh, Christian, evangelical Christians and moderate libertarians or something else, just say, hey, we're gonna come together to talk, you know, the kids, by the time they're in eighth grade, they could talk about the constitution, that would be fine. Or at, you know, five, they're gonna, you know, learn about colors, that would be fine, then do that. So that's why, that to me is where a lot of this stuff, if we could just revert back to some of those documents from way back when, I think we'd be in a lot mm -hmm. better shape. Yeah, so we're, we're never gonna uh, get rid of all public schools and just have nothing but private schools. But, but so what you're saying is school choice or school vouchers uh, where the money goes yeah. to the parents to, to, instead of the zip code school system we have now in which you have to go to the school that is in your neighborhood and that drives prices up of houses that are in better school districts, making the schools even better, making the housing prices even more. And then you get this widening divide of education and, and wealth in these communities. Um, that seems pretty problematic. But let's see how far you want to go in the, this other direction. I was on this um, podcast called Live and Let Live. These are hardcore libertarian. These are like anarcho-capitalist type libertarians. So we brought up the Leah Thomas case and I said, well, maybe they should have a trans division or maybe she can compete against the women, but that there's still one, two, three women and then she gets a medal or whatever. And they go, no, 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 no. Just start your own N N NCAA. Just start your own sanctioning body and and a whole new thing. And that reminded me of when the U.S. United States Football League was trying to go in and they couldn't compete against the NFL because yep. how do you compete against the NFL? And they sued them because they're a monopoly. And the judge said, okay, well, you, you win a dollar because they are a monopoly, but good luck. <laughs> <laughs> you know? right. So it's one thing to say, yeah, yeah, just privatize everything and, and let people do their own thing. Well, but that's not really the world we live in. How far can you go with that? So I love these ANCAP conversations and uh, Michael Malice, I don't know if you've uh, talked with him on either of your podcasts, but he's a great sort of ANCAP thinker and I, I love all this stuff. So first off, I would say, as opposed to creating, if you wanna give the wokesters what they want, instead of creating a trans division, how about we just remove sex altogether and let everybody compete and then let's see how the woke feminists feel. Because what they're gonna realize is every single race or every single match or every single basketball game is gonna end the exact same way and we all know it, I don't even have to say it. But that would be the, if you really wanna do sort of the, let's just think that gender and sexuality and skill and all of these things, none of this matters, that's what I would do. Just remove all of it if that's what you really want. And I, have, I suspect uh, perhaps that some of our first wave feminist friends will not be so thrilled. The, the third or fourth wave or whatever wave they're on now will be applauding as men win everything. It's quite extraordinary. Um, as for the idea of, of creating your own things, it's not a perfect system, but I think that usually actually is the answer, especially in a time that we live in now where our structures are so flawed and so uh, sick, I would argue, that, look, I was not happy with what was going on with Twitter and YouTube and Facebook and everything else. I had an idea for a tech company. I started talking to some people and it eventually became Locals, and three years later, Locals merged with Rumble, and we really are building some alternative pipes to the internet. We really are doing it right now. Um, it's not a perfect answer. We have major hurdles we still have to face, 
Um, so it's not easy to create the USFL. You can also ask the XFL guys about that. That didn't work out well either. And they had plenty of money behind them too. So it's not that it's automatically going to work, but I, I, as a general rule, I always believe in human ingenuity and I believe in the individual more than I believe in the system. I'm, I, I would say I'm sort of short on the system and long on the individual. And so while it's not going to solve all of the problems, and of course, of course, to really build things properly, you're going to need, it's going to take a certain set of people with a certain amount of money and a certain amount of connections and all of those things. So it might be easier for people that live in the suburbs of New York who are around a certain amount of capital or whatever, although maybe New York's not the best example anymore. Probably Miami would be a better example. That's going to be a lot easier perhaps than a certain set of people in Alabama, maybe. But you know what? Those folks in Alabama might be able to get a, a, a cheap building somewhere and find a teacher somewhere and, and build something. So I, I'm with you. It's not perfect. But I, I just don't think that perfect exists in a country of 350 million people. Yeah, of course. As Thomas Sowell always said, there's no uh, solutions, just compromises. Uh, that's, that's the world we live in. Yeah, so the right wing speed maniac, of it, white supremacist, <laughs> yes. Thomas Sowell. Uh, right. So the tech companies, right? So it, it, it concerned me with this talk last year about uh, regulating the tech companies or breaking them up or whatever. Uh, th this is always problematic because these things are fleeting. I mean, how long will Twitter be the monopoly? Well, I don't know yep. how Rumble is doing, uh, but you know, remember, just go back decades or a half century. You know, General Motors and IBM. That that was everything. No one even talks about them anymore. Really, it's, you know, Apple and Google and Twitter. Okay, well, and Facebook. All right, so maybe in 20 years, we won't be talking about them without having the government need to break them up or anything like that. Although the counter to that is, well, how do you go against Twitter? They're essentially a monopoly, but, but they're not. And uh, how do you go against Instagram or Facebook? Well, I don't know. Maybe the Peter Thiels of the world can, can just start their own companies. Or yesterday, Elon Musk bought over 10% yep. of... Twitter shares, okay, so now he has a seat on the board and he's been tweeting out, you know, how about uh, we have a spell check program and he misspelled yes and no. It's really funny. Uh, yeah, that yeah. seems like yes a market. And on. Pretty great. The, that, the, uh, yeah. And I don't know if you saw the, um, oh, there was a back to back tweets of uh, who, who's the New York Times uh, Pulitzer Prize or the um, Nobel Prize winning economist. Um, uh, uh, oh, oh, no, Thomas no, no, no. No, no, sorry. It was uh, Bill Clinton's oh, uh, uh, Paul secretary. Krugman, are you talking about? Yeah, but I'm no, I'm thinking of um, oh, oh, Robert Reich. Yes, I saw Robert, Robert Reich. Reich. Did it you was see those tweets? I retweeted yeah. it. I said I want to, I want to frame this thing. It's so <laughs> oh, perfect. That was you. I you're got talking from about you. defiant L's, <laughs> right? Yes, that was too funny. Well, those of you listening, to it, so the first tweet was from some other time where he said, "People don't understand free speech. You know, Twitter and uh, has nothing to do with the First Amendment." And then the next one was in response to Elon. You know. But how can we have an oligarch telling us what we can and cannot say? It's like, <laughs> <laughs> it was so funny. Um, I, yeah, I'm so not I'd kidding. See... I, I think I might frame that one. It, it was so yeah, perfect yeah, to yeah, juxtapose yeah. those two things. It was spectacular. Yeah. I don't think I, I well, knew so that. It's you're... a good question. It, it's a good question. And you and I, you and I both fall, generally speaking, more on the libertarian side of things. So I'm, I'm, I'm with you on the general premise. Look, the government is the biggest thing. And usually the biggest thing has the power to create the most problems. And, and all of our founding documents, they were always worried about the government because they couldn't envision that these companies could have ever been so big and so ubiquitous and in our pocket and in our lives and control all this information and use us as the products in essence. Um, but all that being said, I actually think that you're right, that breaking them up or, well, first off, you know, there are certain people that always say regulate them as if that just means anything, regulate them. So, okay, so what are you gonna do? You're gonna send a government regulator with his corny government plastic hat <laughs> and his dorky shirt and his pocket protector. You're gonna send them into Google. Let me see the algorithm, Mr. Google. <laughs> mm -hmm. These people couldn't do anything. I mean, have you met people that work for the government? They can't fix anything. So the idea that you'd regulate them, that the government even has the technological wherewithal to regulate, I think is nonsense. Then there's the second part you mentioned, which is that you could break them up. In essence, these companies have sort of spread across too many industries. So Amazon would be the great example of this. There's the Amazon marketplace to purchase products, but Amazon really makes most of its money, if I'm not mistaken, on AWS, Amazon Web Services, which is the underbelly of the internet, which is why after January 6th, they literally just pressed a button or pulled a lever, I don't know what they do, and blew up Parler. They blew up the competition, which had 23 million users on it. Quite, quite incredible actually. 
So there's some argument around that that I could maybe get on board a little bit. And some of the people that we know, Peter Thiel, Blake Masters, the, from the more libertarian side of the tech world, are a little bit more on that side of things. David Sachs is another one that are a little bit, at least, if the government is to exist, then maybe at the very least it could separate the companies so they couldn't be so connected in all the ways. I think there's some validity to that, but I, I, think, I think I can tell by the way you're nodding your head you're not really a fan of that either. And I'm not really either. I, I think these things will fail by the weight of their own nonsense over time. You know, look, add the woke thing to this. Twitter does not hire the best engineers anymore and neither does Google because they hire based on diversity and inclusion. If, when I hire for my company, I don't care what color you are. I don't care what gender you are, anything else. I hire the best employees, period. And I have a pretty spectacular team right now that I'm very proud of. Um, they don't. They don't, and over time, the hospitals that don't hire the best doctors, but they choose them because they're trans or whatever they might be, will not be the hospitals that people wanna have surgery at. Just as the, the tech services that we use, if they don't hire the best engineers, will not work the best. So it's a long game, and just like the previous answer related to sports, it's not, a, it's not the perfect answer, like, oh, let's wrap this thing up and we're good to go. I believe in new products. I, build, I believe in building a better mousetrap, just because the, you, the government, I suppose, can do something doesn't mean that it should. One of my favorite lines from Herb Stein, Stein's Law, things that can't go on forever won't. <laughs> but then there's a corollary to that, that things that can't go on forever can go on for a lot longer than you think. So I could see <laughs> so <that's>... some, a, <laughs> a company like Google or Apple, e even if they're not hiring the best people or they're compromising here and there, th they can go on for a long time because they're so big. But on the other hand, that's what we said about General Motors and IBM and all that. And if you look at the Fortune 500 company over the last century, you know, most of the ones that are on top now didn't e exist. Most of the ones that were big, you know, they either uh, went out of business or they got bought up or merged and so on. That's just the nature of things. And, you know, uh, it, it seems like because we're so ensconced in social media and Internet now that, you know, this is everything. It may not be everything. It could be we, you know, we just push it to the side in 25 years. Maybe it won't. It, there'll be something else. I just can't even think of what it would be. And if I could, I would I would invest in it. But I remember that line from Bill Gates. Yeah. He gave he gave an interview, I think, in 98. And somebody asked him, one of these tech um, journalists, you know, what are you worried about? And he said, uh, I'm worried about there's probably a couple of guys in a garage doing something that I can't think of. And, you know, this was the same year that that uh, Sergey Brin and, and uh, Larry Page started Google. And then, you know, IPO three oh, years funny. later, and boom. And it's like, ah, OK, you know, if, if Bill Gates didn't really think of that and, you know, you know so who knows what's going to be hot then in 20 years and in, in, in the, the conversation about breaking up Twitter and Facebook, it just seems silly. Yeah, I, I look, that's why I said build a better mousetrap. That's why I put my money where my mouth was. And, and for the last three years of my life, until we merged with Rumble, believe it or not, most of my working day was dealing with local stuff more than even dealing with my show or my production company because building a tech company ain't easy. But I really felt, you know, I was having all of these conversations with so many of the people that, that we're friends with about all of these problems related to big tech and wokeness and everything. And I kept thinking, why doesn't anyone do anything? And I guess in my naivete, I thought, I don't know, I'm somebody, I'll do something. And, and I did, and it worked, and we've got something. So I love that story more than, I'm not saying that there's no place for it. I, I'm not totally sure that you're even saying that. I, I think you're sort of saying that there's basically no place, but I don't know that you fully said there's absolutely no place. And to me, in an argument like this, I, I've discussed this with Tucker Carlson once on his show, because he does want, he's almost fully a libertarian in a lot of respects, but he does want some regulation here, because his argument is these things are so dangerous that if the government's not to do something about this, then there's no point in the government, which is actually a very ANCAP argument that really there is no point for the government. Um, what I've said to Tucker is, you know, I think you have to fight a war many ways. So we need guys like Tucker out there to put the pressure on and say, hey, regulate, regulate, and scare these guys a little bit, right? We need a guy like Ted Cruz to, or Rand Paul to call for these congressional hearings and get them out there under oath to say these things. Then you need guys that are gonna build some things. You need guys that are gonna share the ideas of liberty and competition and freedom. So there's many ways to fight this war. I, I don't think there's one perfectly solid answer. Because look, at the end of the day, you know, Tucker, he can, I love Tucker, but he can complain about it, but nothing happened. So that's why you have to build new things either way. 
I can't remember if you've had John Mackey on your show, you know, Conscious Capitalism. The I, I've CEO, met him Whole a couple Foods. times yeah. over the yeah, years, but a, I haven't had a, him on. He's a super good guy. Well, his Conscious Capitalism argument is basically we should be doing these things anyway. That is investing in our local communities, investing in our employees, you know, kind of which would be sort of a labor, liberal labor type argument for the way companies should be run. Mm-hmm. That is your, you know, your quarterly profits is not the only thing that matters. And of course, he's, you know, as a libertarian, he's, of course, profits are great. That's the whole point of being in business. But you got, but there's more to it than that. But one undertow to his argument is that if we don't do it ourselves, the government's going to do it and they're going to do it way worse than we will. That is come in and make us take care of, uh, uh, pay our employees more or whatever. So let's just pay them more anyway, because that's the right thing to do. And then we don't have to deal with the government. (laughs) And by the way, the proof's in the pudding because Whole Foods, as far as I know, John Mackey's company is highly profitable. You go into any, I've never been into a Whole Foods that I thought this store is not run well or doesn't have stuff on the shelves or the employees are unpleasant. I mean, it's an incredibly well-run company. I've read stories about Whole Foods. I mean, the employees seem to really like it. Um, it, They've got great products. Their fruit is always fresh. I mean, he's he's a living, breathing example of it. You know, another great example is... um, uh, oh, the guy from bb and I'm suddenly blanking on his name, the former CEO of bb and who was, was also a libertarian. He's an Ayn Rand guy. Um, oh, I'll, I'll think of his name in just a second. But he was the, the CEO of, of bb and during the bailout a couple of years ago during the, the housing meltdown. And he ran the banks really, really well because he's an Ayn Rand guy and he's mostly a libertarian and he didn't want to give out these crazy loans and the subprime stuff and everything else. The economy then crashed. His bank was doing just fine. You know what the government forced them to do? Uh, John Allison is his name. I just got it. Um, oh, right. What the government forced them to do was take the bailout money. He didn't want the bailout money. He said, wait a minute. Citibank crashed because of this. And uh, Wells, Wells Fargo was actually sort of okay too. But a bunch of, you know, Chase screwed up and all these big banks screwed up. He said, wait a minute. We didn't do any of that stuff. We lived within our means. We didn't loan money to people to buy a $5 million house when you're making $50,000 a year. Why do we have to take this money? The government still forced him to take it. So that's a, a very similar thing that if you live, it's a slightly other version of it, but, but that there are CEOs that do the responsible thing and do the right thing and it leads to a better product and it leads to a, a, a better business. Well, and in terms of what you do compared to old media in which there weren't very many options, you would probably have never had a show had you come of age in the 60s and 70s. And, you know, Larry King got that job. That's it. That was the only job yep. there was for somebody doing what you're doing. Now, you know, uh, millions of people can do it. So that's the positive end of the business part of the Internet, I think, is just more options for more people to uh, fulfill their dreams. And you're one of them. I mean, when I met you, uh, you, you talked about Larry King, and I thought, this guy's the, the next Larry King. But, you know, when there's three networks and CNN and that's it, well, there aren't going to be very many Larry Kings. It's just the way it is. So that's no, a good it's, thing. But, you know, it's really, it, it's a beautiful thing. You know, I just thought, hey, let me just have these conversations with some people. And I started talking to a couple people. And you were one of my very, very, very early guests, maybe the 10th guest I had on the show, something like that. And, and then by having you on, that I think maybe connected me with uh, Pete Bogosian. And then I had Pete on. I think that connected me with Ion Hersi Ali. This beautiful orchestration of people that, we're thinking about things a little bit differently, maybe having long form conversations that, you know, seven years ago when I started doing it, almost nobody was doing it now. Now kind of everybody's doing it. And I think that's just fine. You know, I have my audience. We, we had our best numbers across the board last month, what but, I, but I, I don't say that as a pat on my back. I say it on, on, on sort of like, there's a gajillion shows out there. If you like what I do, great. If you like what Sherber does, great. And hopefully you listen to both. And if on, for three weeks, you're like, ah, I've had enough Ruben, I'm going to listen to Rogan or whatever it might be. I think that's just fine. You know, you just have to, if you do something decent, I think decent people uh, will find you. And, and that's what I've tried to do. And I guess I've done it okay somehow through this. I think a lot of older people don't get it. Like uh, Bill Gates, uh, I, I, I'm on every publicist's uh, book list. So uh, his publicist sent me his book on the environment and you know, is there anything you could do to help us promote, you know, Bill's book? I said, yeah, have, have him on my podcast. We can yeah. talk for an hour and a half and, and I reach a hundred thousand people and well, no, Bill doesn't do podcasts. He only does mainstream media. So, okay, let me get this straight. You'd rather be on Anderson Cooper for six <laughs> minutes 
when you could go on Joe Rogan for three hours and have 10 million people uh, buy your book. Okay, that's a good move. <laughs> you know, you made a really interesting point there about the chair, sort of, that there was one chair or three networks, that sort of thing. Larry King was the guy that was going to do the interviews. You know, this week there's been some talk that Brian Stelter on CNN, who was supposed to be their media watchdog, and I think he's just become sort of the generic sort of lefty punching bag kind of thing. You know, that there's been some talk that he's going to get fired. And it's like a guy like him, when he gets fired, he, he will start a podcast, I promise you. He will, be, he will get a YouTube show or start a YouTube show. Nobody's going to listen. Nobody's going to subscribe or pay. They're paying for the chair, meaning that Reliable Sources, the Sunday morning watchdog show on CNN, was hosted by a guy by the name of Howard Kurtz for a couple decades before that. He, he moved to Fox. But they're, no one's tuning in. I like Brian Stelter, and that's why I'm watching. They're not. There are people that go, you know, I read Skeptic Magazine, and I really like what Michael Shermer does, and he debunks all of this nonsense, and I, I subscribe to Skeptic, and I listen to the podcast. But these other guys, they're, they're just placeholders for the chair. That's one thing that really, really has shifted. I, I promise you, no one is going to be subscribing to the Brian Stelter Substack. I don't mean that with joy or anything, really. I don't really like his work, obviously. I don't mean that, I don't mean that to be um, gratuitous, to gratuitously attack him. I mean it just relative to what we're talking about. These old institutions have a very thin layer of influence left, and the rest of us are kind of just going right through it. It's hard to keep up with it. I mean, I'm 67. I'm trying to scramble to keep up with the changing media. You know, I just opened a Tic Tac account and I haven't made a video yet, but I'm, I'm not going to be twerking or anything like Get that. Get off crazy. TikTok, man. I'm not on Tic Tac. What do you want? <laughs> okay. The Chinese to know all your stuff? Come oh, on. What are yeah, you doing? That's right. I forgot. Okay. And Instagram and Facebook and Twitter and so on. Yeah. But the question is, what's the next big thing? I have no idea. Do you have any idea? <laughs> well, look, they, they definitely want to push us towards the metaverse. That really is the thing. They want us on, you know, all strapped to an Oculus and living in this 3D world where they can constantly feed us all of our pleasures and our fears and all of those things. And you can feel that thing really coming. It's why Facebook changed the corporate name to Meta. That does feel like the thing. I suspect that there's going to be a major anti-tech movement over the next couple of years. You're feeling it a little bit already. You know, I do my August off the grid thing for the last five years with no phone, no, no news, no TV or anything. I don't think people want to live in that world. I actually think a lot of people 20 years after social media now realize, boy, we really were social in a good way beforehand. And although there's a lot of goodness here and, you know, Michael, we became friends through this thing and everything and people can listen to us and all that stuff. It brought, it brought a lot of bad stuff too. And I think people will yearn to return to a, a more sane real world while they push us further and further into the meta world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember being out somewhere and I'd left my phone at home and I had like a couple hours to kill before I had to be somewhere else. And I was just sitting there going, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? I, I can't. <laughs> I thought, you know what? I'm just going to walk around and look at stuff and watch people and maybe go into some stores. And it turned out to be, it's like, hey, I remember this. This was fun. <laughs> it wasn't the worst day of your life, was no. it? No. <laughs> All right, Dave, I know we're coming up on a, on a hard uh, hour out here because you've got a series of uh, book uh, tour interviews. So just give us the quick thumbnail and how this is something of a sequel to your Don't Burn This Book. This is Don't Burn This Country. Uh, what, what's, uh, how is this uh, different and, and, and what are you building on? Yeah, look, the first book was, was very simple for me in a certain way, even though it was my first book. How about, you've, been, you've written like 87 books already, right? How many? How many? <laughs> 13. 13 books. 13. 13. <laughs> Um, but I'm older the first than you. Book, although it was hard, it was, <laughs> I'm, I'm getting there, don't worry. Um, the first book, although it was my first book, was sort of easy to write because I was laying out the principles that I had been talking about for these years and my classically liberal principles, and it was a little bit of a biography as well. This book really is, well, well, okay, the woke haven't stopped, the collectivists haven't stopped, our old things are melting, and, and what are you going to do in the face of that? So this book, I would say, is, is some ways a how-to on how to get out of this, that know how to do some things. Don't feel that you have to go to college because that's what everyone told you before that. Know that when you sign up for big tech, they're stealing your data and in many ways weaponizing it against you. Know that you have individual rights that are not granted by the government. They're, they're either you know human rights or, or God-given rights. That's a whole other topic. Uh, know that, that there are ways to look at the world that are not just the ways that are being force-fed to us. 
and don't feel you need these major systems. I, I think that really is it, that it's, it's sort of like you've got the individual and the out of the individual grows the family and out of that grows a community. And I think if we all return to that, that actually is probably the answer to almost everything that we've talked about for the last hour. Yeah, I like the, the family Otherwise, element I'll in the book. Otherwise, I'll see you in Gulag 231C, my <laughs> friend. Right. Is that in Florida or in Texas? <laughs> I assure you it's in California. <laughs> oh, it's in California. Yes, where I still am. I'm stuck here in Santa Barbara. Well, I, I, I can't complain really too much. All yeah, right, you'll Dave. be okay over there. <laughs> I know you got to move on to your next interview. Congratulations on the new book. We'll drop this on the day it, it, it publishes. And uh, we'll see you on the, on the TV shows that, that, when you do your book tour. And I'll see you in Florida or if you get back to California. Most <laughs> likely it'll be in Florida. Michael, it's always yeah, great probably. talking to you. All right.